It's still difficult getting up that hill there. Uh, but you know, that's what life's all about, right? Uh, it's, life is not easy. To get up the hill, you got to work at it. And when Jesus is talking about the narrow gate, he's talking about being obedient to him. And he also included in that verse, only a few do that. But you know, it doesn't take any effort to go down the hill. It is easy. And people, go, basically, they go real quickly and fast. And what I'm saying is, be disobedient to God. And that's what the majority are. And that gate is wide. But let me tell you, when you start going downhill, you're going to increase in speed. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to come around dead man's curve, and you crash and burn. Yeah. Because everybody who keeps and continues to go downhill, basically ends up in hell. Because the majority of mankind will not under any circumstances, obey God's plan or pattern of salvation. If we were to talk to 12 people about being saved, you're going to hear a dozen different ways on being saved. However, the matter of seeking New Testament salvation, no creed or doctrines of man can provide adequate guidance. Only one source can present the truth about what God expects of those who seek Him for eternal life. His inspired Word, the Bible. And this morning in our study, the New Testament has everything that you need to know. So what does the Scripture say about how the lost sinner is to be saved or forgiven of their sins? In the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, it gives graphic lessons in addition to the apostles' teaching. We will clearly see eight different cases in which a group of people or a person was converted to Christ. Now, in the science of biblical hermeneutics, one important rule is that you collect everything on any given subject before you reach your final conclusion on that topic. Now isn't that just common sense? Such is the case with the Christian conversions as found in the book of Acts. When we gather or when we put all eight together, we have a complete account of all the truth that is necessary by God to be saved only the Bible way. Case number one. In Acts chapter 2, it describes the beginning of the New Testament church on the Jewish day of Pentecost. Now in the process, it presents the first great sermon of the Christian age. This lesson was delivered by the Apostle Peter, starting in verse 14, we're in Acts chapter 2, and continuing through verse 36. It has one central thing. Jesus Christ the Son of God. Now a large assembly has heard Peter's sermon concerning Jesus as the Lord and Savior of the world. Now Peter closes with this statement. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ this Jesus whom you've crucified. That's in verse 36. Now, the multitude's reaction is recorded in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now, in observing what happened here, we notice, first, that Jesus had been preached, second, that Peter's audience, believing what they had heard about Jesus, were now convinced that he must be Christ, the Son of God. They made known their faith by mouth with word. Now having gone this far, they are ready for the apostles' instruction in verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's verse 38, as was said. Now, after Peter's listeners were, fairly, were further instructed and exhorted, the narrative closes by saying in verse 41, 
So then those who had received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So in our first example, we find that the whole process of salvation began with the preaching of Jesus, after which people having believed in him as Lord and Christ, made their belief known, that repented of their sins, and were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Case number two. In Acts chapter 8, we find another account of New Testament conversion. This time it's among the Samaritan people. Chapter 8, starting at verse 4 to 6. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was being said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. Now the story quickly is carried to its conclusion in verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized men and women alike. While this narrative is briefer than the one that we previously just listened to in Acts chapter 2, the story is essentially the same. Jesus was preached, people believed, they changed the direction of their lives, and they were baptized. Case number three is an individual commonly called the Ethiopian eunuch. It's in the same chapter 8, and Luke, who records this, gives us another God-given example of conversion. Now this time, the man who became a New Testament Christian was a devout individual in Judaism and living in the country of Ethiopia, returning from worshiping in Jerusalem while on a desert road. He was reading Old Testament Isaiah chapter 53. There was met by the same Philip we had just mentioned. He's invited upon the eunuch's chariot, and Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him, verse 35. Now, as a result of this preaching, the man from Ethiopia desired to become a Christian. Now, the scriptures describe what was done in these words, verse 36. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? Verse 38. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. This conversion story is as those preceding it. First, there is the preaching of Jesus, followed by faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, a change of will, and then water baptism. Case number four. Saul from the city of Tarsus. It is in Acts chapter 9, we read of the conversion of a Jewish Pharisee called Saul, who later become known as the Apostle Paul, and he will retell his own conversion story in Acts chapter 22 and chapter 26. But in Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 3 to 9, and it came about that he, as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed, around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Lord, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise and enter the city and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he couldn't see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate or, nor drank. Now after spending three days in prayer and fasting, this foremost of sinners, who had now believed Jesus as will be in the Christ, the Son of God, received a welcome visitor named Ananias, a preacher of the New Testament gospel of Christ. This New Testament Christian was sent from God to instruct Saul as to what he must do in order to be saved. Now what instructions did Ananias give Saul who was still on his knees 
in prayer, chapter 9, verse 11. Here's what he says. And why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Chapter 22, verse 16. Now the parallel account is back in Acts chapter 9, verse 18. And he regained his sight and he arose and was baptized. In this conversion story, as in the others, belief with the making known of the person's faith was followed by repentance and water baptism for the washing away of sins. All right, now we're halfway there. Are you still with me? We have seen four accounts in the book of Acts telling how certain people, either as a group or an individual, became a New Testament Christian in the first century. Each began in a different circumstance, yet all were told to be saved in the same manner. This identical pattern continues throughout the book of Acts with four more illustrations from God's plan. Case number five. In Acts chapter 10, we have Cornelius and his household. This is the first recorded Gentiles in the New Testament church. One of the most intriguing of all the conversion stories in the New Testament is that of a Roman centurion who was like a sergeant major in the army that was stationed with the occupational troops in Palestine. So I'm in chapter 10 and I'm reading verse 1 through 5. Now there was a certain man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms, that's deeds of charity or love, to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in to him and said to him, Cornelius, and fixing his gaze upon him and being much alarmed, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon who is also called Peter. Now we later learn that God also told Cornelius that Peter shall speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and all your household. That's chapter 8, or chapter 11 of Acts, verse 14. Now, as all these kind of unusual events were occurring around Peter and Cornelius, Peter was summoned to preach Jesus to Cornelius and his household. Now, as we might expect, Peter's sermon centered on the life of Jesus the Christ. This is in Acts chapter 10, verse 34 to 43. Now, Peter concludes with verse 43. Of him, Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him has received forgiveness of sin. Cornelius and his household made known their faith in Jesus as the Son of God, and after which Peter, in verse 48, ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So here again, after Jesus was pre preached, people believed, changed the direction of their lives, and were water baptized in order to become New Testament Christians. Case number six in Acts chapter 16 we have Lydia and her household. Here contains the conversion of a businesswoman who had migrated to the continent of Europe to sell expensive purple cloth. Lydia is the first recorded Christian convert in Europe. While in the city of Philippi, Lydia, we find here that Paul and his companions, they sought out several women who were assembled at a riverbank, <coughs> thinking that this would be a place of prayer, and then they preached to them the good news of Jesus Christ. Now this account of this event, it is recorded in verse 13 to 15. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled, and a certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics and a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken of Paul by Paul. And when her, she and her household 
had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Once again, the New Testament gospel of Jesus was preached. And those with open minds or receptive hearts believed the message and were baptized in water. Case number seven. Also in chapter 16 of the book of Acts. And in the same city, we have the Philippian jailer and his household. We find the conversion story here of our second Roman official. Paul and Silas, after being beaten with many blows of either metal or wooden rods by the Roman authorities, were given to the jailer to guard them securely. So in an inner prison, their feet were placed or being held firmly in stocks. Now, as Paul and Silas were singing and praying and giving praise to God about midnight, an earthquake occurred, and all the cell doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. The jailer was awakened from his sleep, and he moved quickly to evaluate the situation which appeared grim to the point that he was ready to take his own life, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, in chapter 16, starting in verse 20, uh, 23, uh, says, uh, or not 23, earlier than that, uh, says, but Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, do yourself no harm. For we are all here. And he called for lights and he rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his household. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized and all his household. Now in this strange setting of a prison house, Paul preached to them concerning Jesus. Those who heard believed. They committed themselves to the Lord. They turned away from wickedness. The washed wounds are repentance. And then were baptized into Christ immediately, which could have been three in the morning. They did not wait for the sun to rise. They did not schedule their baptism for a more convenient time. Case number eight, the citizens of Corinth. Our final account of conversions that we have time for this morning is in Acts chapter 18. Here again, the story concerns Paul, who had moved on from the, to the city of Corinth after leaving Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens, having taught the same thing throughout Greece. It is a very ungodly pagan setting. But Paul was able to find a small colony of Jews who had a synagogue in verse 4. And he was reckoning in the synagogue every Sabbath in trying to persuade Jews and Greeks to accept the New Testament gospel message of Jesus. And as the story continues, we read verse 8. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and be baptized. When Paul preached concerning Jesus among the immoral Gentile Corinthians, these as well as the godly Jews heard and believed, committed their lives to the Lord Jesus, and then were baptized. In every New Testament case of conversion, those who listened to the preaching of the New Testament gospel developed a belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Hearing the message and believing the context are the beginning steps towards your spiritual salvation. One story shows that the believers confessed a great concern and wanted to know, what shall we do? Another account strongly expressed the desire then and there to be baptized. Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Particularly in the case of the jailer, we see the immediate response of repentance in washing the, wind, the wounds of Paul and Silas, as well as immediately being baptized. Every biblical conversion 
in which a person became a New Testament Christian shows that the person experienced baptism. It is in water baptism that one comes in contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus. So, in each New Testament case of conversion, we have seen the crucial matter of belief in Jesus as the Son of God. In the words of Jesus himself, he declares, He who has believed, believed what, Lord? The New Testament gospel. And has been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved, disbelieved what? Does not obey shall be condemned. Mark 16, verse 16. Now, after a person had believed in Jesus as God's Son, the risen Savior, it was necessary that the individual be willing to turn from the world and evil towards the Lord and His righteousness, which is repentance. To the learned Athenians, Paul professes, Therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. Acts 17, verse 30. Now, repentance is giving up any lifestyle that is not in harmony with God's will. It is making a change in your life so that you are now in agreement with the pure teachings of the New Testament and will practice them. You are taking self off the throne and placing God there. He is now in control of you. The concluding act of becoming a Christian was always a burial in water. Over a hundred times in the New Testament we find forms of the word baptism, noun and verb, emphasizing the high regard that Christ and his followers had for the act of water baptism. In fact, of all the necessary steps in becoming a New Testament Christian, the only one that is explicitly mentioned in each of the eight conversion stories that we have studied this morning is the act of baptism. Now I wonder why. Now this is not to suggest that faith was not present in these stories. Even if faith was not mentioned by name in all eight, it is still implied. Yet it still does indicate that baptism must be important. If it wasn't, then why would every, or that God had mentioned it every time and the pattern of salvation? Now to the New Testament church in Rome, Paul was especially helpful in explaining the deep spiritual significance of baptism. He indicated that when a sinner is baptized in water, he symbolically goes through an act like the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now listen to Paul as he writes in chapter 6 of Romans, verse 3 to 5. Or do you not know that all of us, he's including himself, because you remember he was baptized, who have been buried in, or have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul goes on in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism. So two passages, baptism is called a burial. Now being buried in dirt is a complete covering. So how can this word buried include sprinkling or pouring some water over another? It cannot. This morning, we have simply gone back to the Bible in our study. We have examined the question, what must a person do to be saved? And we have listened to God's answer that's recorded on the pages of the New Testament. If you notice, we have not looked at any denominational church creeds. We have not compared one set of beliefs with another to like or dislike. 
We have just simply turned to the New Testament of the Bible, to the inspired book of Acts, and we have found eight significant stories that God, the Holy Spirit, provided to answer our questions about how to be saved today in our century. And going back to the Bible, we have not found infant baptism. Did you notice that? Not one of these eight New Testament examples involves baby. Now, do you know from the scripture who is only involved? Those who are saved were old enough to hear the New Testament gospel and understanding believe the message. Those who are saved were old enough to have committed sin in which to repent of their witness, uh, uh, wickedness. Now remember back in Acts 8 verse 12, they were being baptized men and women alike. There are not any infants mentioned in that verse. Why? Because they were not old enough to believe and they were sinless. They've not done anything wrong to repent. All the people who turned to Jesus after hearing and believing the New Testament gospel that was preached by Peter, Paul, and the others taught only immersion in water, not sprinkling or pouring. So let's take a moment and examine baptism as being immersion only. What does the word baptism mean? Well, if you look the word up in an English dictionary, you are going to find an assortment of answers. But keep in mind that our English dictionaries give you the present day usage as to the mold being of sprinkling or pouring and not just the biblical meaning. Because our New Testament was originally written in Greek, Koine, or the common language, you will find the true English meaning of baptism by examining a Greek Dictionary called a lexicon. For example, bapto is to dip. Baptizo is to dip, immerse. Baptisma is immersion. And baptismos is an act of dipping or immersion. So, when any of these New Testament preachers in any of the eight conversions mentioned baptism, they commanded water immersion only and not sprinkling or pouring of any water. Any religious baptism of pouring and sprinkling is not valid in God's sight. It is done without His authority. Listen to these Bible verses. Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to or take away. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 32. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you've received, let him be accursed. Galatians 1 verse 9. God does not allow our tampering with his Bible, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And he is very serious about that. We also have not found any doctrine in these eight examples of being saved by faith only or belief alone. Every one of these eight conversions in Acts responded in obedience to given commands. They did something. They repented within their hearts and their bodies in water immersion had their sins washed away. So they committed an action. They did a deed or a work of faith out of love, not to earn or merit salvation. And going back to God's commands that are found in the New Testament, we bypass many doctrines and practices that are familiar in our religious community today that came into practice a few centuries after the New Testament had been written. But we have discovered what it means to be saved the Bible way. For everything we teach, we should have this attitude. Thus saith the Lord, or in modern 
language. This is the only way God says to do it. Not only does this principle work on becoming a New Testament Christian, but it should also be applied to every other area of our relationship with God as he has given us additional patterns than just the plan of salvation for us to practice. I can give you no better advice than the pr uh, principle which was used nearly 200 years ago in the American Restoration Movement. Let us speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. Yet in spite of God's clearly given direction, the denominational churches are confused and they get it all wrong. In the New Testament, erring Christians already baptized are told to pray for forgiveness like the new Christian named Simon in Acts chapter 8 verse 22. Non-Christians, those not in the New Testament church are never told to pray for the forgiveness of sins. Rather, one never having obeyed the New Testament gospel are told in order to get right with God, they are to do what the people listed in our eight examples did. No more, no less, just that. They are commanded to repent and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of their sins. The so-called sinner's prayer practiced and any denomination is not found in the New Testament. It is something that was added by false teachers and is among the doctrines of demons. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. So I asked, how could anything be incorrect with this approach that's listed in the book of Acts that was given by God? Mankind will build better cars with next year's model than now. We will make superior technical equipment tomorrow than today. But nobody can ever improve on any of God's patterns. Our infinite God gave them as perfection without any flaws. Yet anything that we produce can be full of errors or have countless mistakes. Therefore, common sense tells us to go back to the teachings that are found in the New Testament to return or to restore the original Christian doctrine and practices of these first century men and women in the Bible. Doing so is the only safe approach because it is absolute truth. No group of people or any preacher can promise salvation except through that one New Testament church which Christ shed his blood and died to establish, Acts chapter 2. The only way to God is the one that is found in our eight New Testament conversions. Upon their obedience, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Jeremiah, in chapter 6, verse 16, we read, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways, and see, and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and you shall find rest for your soul. That's what God is asking of you this morning to obey the truth of his will. Yet the children of Israel during the days of the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah said in the very last part of verse 16, we will not walk in it. And we all know what became of those rebellious people. The Babylonians destroyed the southern kingdom, and wiped out Jerusalem with all her citizens, both young and old, still in the walls, and then took the rest off to slavery for 70 years. Yet let me tell you what, a far greater devastation 
is for anyone today that refuses God's invitation to obey his will shall occur at the second coming. When the Lord Jesus shall reveal, be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. Now listen up. And to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 to 9. This morning, obey this New Testament gospel of our Lord Jesus as is recorded in the book of Acts. Belief, repentance, and water immersion for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, if you do that here in this building, I want you to listen to what Paul says in verse 10, back in that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, we're still talking second coming, to be marveled at among all who have believed. Come forward and be immersed so that you can be among that saved group among the saints because you too will become and be a saint if you obey his will and remain faithful unto death. And I promise you this, that you will never ever regret it because this is the most important decision of your life. So if you're subject to his need, his calling, come right now as together we stand.